Welcome to Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning for Tuesday, October 18th. I'm your host, Tom Orr. The Iowa game is in four days, the game against Michigan in 39 days. We talked on yesterday's show about the fact that last week had been a little crazy. We fell a little behind on uh, Buckeye Weekly episodes. That's my bad. Sorry. Uh, so in an effort to make that up to you, we are doing a little bit of extra, a little bit longer episodes this week on the Buckeye Weekly podcast feed. So we put out a list and, you know, a call for questions. Listeners, help us out with some questions because we want to talk about what you want us to talk about. Let us know what you, what you want us to talk about. And you came through with, let's be honest, maybe too many questions. So uh, we will take a bunch of those. We'll have those on the Buckeye Weekly podcast feed a little later on today with the listener question show. We're also going to answer a few of them right here on Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning, which means my guest, I'll be his guest later on uh, Buckeyes, Buckeye Weekly, but he's going to be my guest right now. Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning, Tony Gerdeman, for the first time ever, welcome to the show. Tom, huge, huge honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I disagree with you chastising the listeners for putting so many questions out. I appreciate the questions. Also, I uh, you are welcome for me doing extra work to make up for your lack of work last week. Again, thank you. I must have missed all the episodes you put out without me. So uh, I'm sure those were great listens. Uh, as we all know, as, as you love to tell everyone, you carry that show. So, you know, I'm sure I'm sure they were fine. I'm sure they were great. So uh, let's you know who's going to carry this show. The listeners. We're going to start with that one from at Chris underscore Estes one. Ohio State just offered four star safety Aiden Schuler from New Jersey. Why would they wait this long to offer? Was he not on their radar previously? Well, and our Alex Gleitman has this broken down really well on our huddle message board. If you want to become a member and check out all of the finer details of this one, but this is basically one of those, uh, it, there's multi facets here. One, it's good to watch a guy through his, his senior year to see him progress some, and they've been keeping an eye on him throughout. And that's why he was on, he's still on the radar and he was previously. You see how they get better. Also, Tom, right now seems to be a pretty good time to start poaching commitments from Notre Dame if that becomes available. Yes, uh, Notre Dame, not quite what you thought they might be at the beginning of the season. And you're, you know, I don't think they're going to fire Marcus Freeman in the next six months or anything like that. But, you know, I think there's a little more uncertainty around the program. And when you have a bad year, Sometimes you get turnover in the assistant ranks. You know, you can have you can have a lot of different uh, forms of fallout from a bad football season. And, you know, that all of that just creates uncertainty. And in recruiting, you are not, you know, you're trying to sell certainty. And, you know, this is comfort relationships, all that kind of stuff. And Notre Dame is very, very big on the four-year decision, for, or the 40-year decision versus the four-year decision. And you want to, you know, you're coming to Notre Dame, not just to play football, but because it's going to set you up for the rest of your life and yada, yada, yada. And if, if you're buying in on that, then maybe this isn't a concern. But, you know, if, if you're, you know, you, you were sold on this because young, energetic head coach, defensive side of the ball, and oh man, he's really going to have this team rolling and look at all the commitments they're getting already. And man, the future is so bright. And it's like, Whoa. Bright futures don't generally involve losing to Marshall and uh, this year's uh, this year's Stanford team uh, in the same season. I think that if I remember correctly, neither th those two teams have not beaten any other FBS teams this season, except for Notre Dame. They were like a combined 0-7 or 0-8 against every other FBS team other than Notre Dame and 2-0 against Notre Dame. So that's not great, strictly speaking. And you know, Notre Dame's got some challenges in the back end of the season. So you just, you know, you're sort of, that uncertainty can play into things a little bit with recruiting as well. Uh, so yeah, that's, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, Alex, like you said, has really good information a lot because Alex has, has a New Jersey kid. Alex knows a lot of the folks involved in this. There's a f interesting Ohio state tie with his uh, high school coach. I mean, there's, there's a lot of really, really good reporting from Alex. So again, you can find that on the huddle board at Buckeye Sign up to become a member today because, you know, the price is, as I like to say, the price of a lousy chain store pizza every month. And boy, Tony, the next month of Ohio State football, like give it a try for 30 days because <laughs> the next month of Ohio State football sure seems like it might be an interesting one, doesn't it? Yeah. And then the hook will be that that fifth week to get you to the like the Michigan game and all of that stuff. So uh, definitely now looking at this Notre Dame schedule, they're three and three now. They still have to go to Syracuse. Or Syracuse, they get Clemson at home. They have to go to USC, so that's 
probably three losses. That's not including the Navy game. And they have Boston College at home. Boston College is not great this year, but if you can lose to Stanford at home, you can lose lose to Boston College at home, and that's that's dang sure. So um they're gonna have to they're gonna have to beat UNLV, Navy, and Boston College to go to a bowl game this year. Because I doubt the grades the I doubt the APR is there for a five and seven <laughs> team should there be uh, not as many bowl teams as necessary. Notre Dame likes to talk a big game, but let's see it in action as a five and seven bowl team. I don't think we will. Boy, I got to tell you, before the season, I did not have Syracuse is not a sure win for Notre Dame <laughs> and UNLV. Like UNLV is not great by any means, but UNLV has been like alive this year, which is a significant upgrade from what they have been for a lot of recent years. Yeah, and I mean, Navy's not very good, but Navy can be a pain in the butt if you catch them on the wrong week. So, yeah, that's you know, six and six and like Notre Dame going six functionally, the difference between Notre Dame going five and seven and six and six is almost nothing. Cause Notre Dame, Notre Dame fans won't acknowledge the existence of the pinstripe bowl or whatever they'd be playing in at that point. But boy, that's, that is a, that is a rough, rough, uh, rough, rough back of the schedule. Cause you got some, you got some sure losses. Clemson, Tony, I just saw something. Clemson has the longest winning streak in the country, 13 games. Did you know that? I, I heard that a couple of weeks ago when it was like 10 or 11 and it seemed like, wow, that's, I would not have guessed that because as we know, Clemson is playing terribly every single week and yet somehow they're beating teams <laughs> by four touchdowns and undefeated at this point. So good on them. And we wrote them off. It, it seems like we wrote them off early last season when it was, you know, the, the, when the passing game and everything was bad and then we just haven't written them back in and yet there they are just waiting in the wings, sidling on up. Yeah, they, they, you felt like they lost two games early last year and everyone just kind of went, well, that's the end of Dabo Swinney. Okay. And, uh, then they replaced both coordinators this offseason. It was like, well, now they're certainly doomed. And then they <laughs> came out and looked terrible at the beginning of the year. And then, but they're just kind of like, mm, they haven't lost a game yet. They're still just kind of hanging out there. I saw a bowl projection, which would be Ohio State versus Clemson in the Fiesta Bowl. So I could see our, uh, old buddy Matt Conley, who covers the, uh, covers the Tigers back in, uh, back in uh, Glendale again this year. So it would be a familiar game. And you know what? That, that's been a, uh, that's been a pretty good series uh, turned, turned into a pretty good rivalry the last few years. So I would not complain about a, you know, rubber match between uh, Clemson and Ohio state in uh, college football playoff games. What was the other game there? Like Tennessee, Georgia or Tennessee, Alabama? Was it two SEC teams? I don't remember. I just kind of looked at the, I, you know, Tony, it's a bowl projection. It doesn't matter. I just happened to, <laughs> I just looked at it. It was like, it was one of those, like I was reading something else and it showed up as the related article right below. I was like, Oh, I'll scroll down and see where Ohio state is. Mm. I don't, I don't remember whether Notre Dame was actually in the pinstripe ball. Tony, that's, that's on me. I apologize. I'm just getting, I'm just getting tired of TCU being disrespected. <laughs> yeah. They, that's another one. Like, boy, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm ready for a TCU playoff team. I don't think I'm going to have to be ready for it, but uh, just, just in case I am, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm ready for it. Hey, speaking of other college football teams, Tony, at Isaac McIntyre, if you had to pick a team to cover other than Ohio State, who would it be and why? You, what do you got? Me? Well, I'm wearing a Hawaii sweatshirt, so I guess I will take the extremely trite answer, like Hawaii. Why? Well, because you're in Hawaii. Um, no, it, it, I think my actual answer for this would be Colorado. Like I would love to cover Colorado. Like it's just, it's a very pretty area. It's a city. It's a team that has just enough history that you've got, you know, I think it's a, it'd be an interesting place to cover the team. If you have a competent coach read, not Carl Durrell, you could probably, you know, probably at least be a decent, you know, a decent team. You don't have a million people on the beat. So it's probably a, you know, a very different experience from covering Ohio state. But yeah, I, I think Colorado would be at the top of my list. But a lot of those, you know, a lot of those places out west, like I wouldn't mind going and covering uh, Wyoming or going and, uh, you know, closer to home, like go cover Ohio University, like just a spot where you can get, you know, you you can sort of explore the space because there's not 50 other people in the room there with you, uh, you know, trying to trying to do the same basic job you are. So, yeah, I, I, I would uh, I'd be interested in a smaller, you know, a smaller beat with the. Uh, you know, more, more opportunity to do kind of creative, interesting, different stuff. What about you? Well, and we've answered this question in different ways over the years. And you know, I've gone with Cincinnati in the past where you can like now as they're moving to the big 12, like there's there, it's not a loaded beat. 
and you're moving into big boy football and there's an, an opportunity to be part of that and to cover it from a bunch of different angles. However, like when I read this this time, my first answer was Tennessee because you, I, I want, I want a rabid fan base. You know, I want to cover something with a rabid fan base and Tennessee has that. Um, it's, it's endlessly chaotic and interesting. And there's nothing more, uh, nothing better for business than the, the coaching carousel in, <laughs> in this business. And things are so chaotic and crazy where you, you know, there's plenty of ammo for columns and all of that good stuff. Maybe a second pick here would be Auburn, which would just be like, a Why? complete madhouse. How, how would that be different than covering Tennessee? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> right now it's on the opposite end of the spectrum from Tennessee. Give it three years when Josh Heupel goes to Oklahoma and you can flip the script and the polarity changes and all of that good stuff. Um, but yeah, what do you, Tom, what do you think about my thought there that Josh Heupel is going to end up at Oklahoma after Brent Venables burns out? You said that, and I immediately went, "Oh no, that's a hundred percent what's going to happen." Yes, uh, what you just you spoke that into existence right there, and I don't know if that's something else that's been out there, but yeah, you you said that it was like, "Oh, yep, yep, that is definitely what's going to happen." They'll, you know, he'll be he'll be annoyed with being behind Georgia just enough that it's like, "All right, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go do the West, and we'll <laughs> stay in the SEC and go coach at Oklahoma." Yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. That, that's an interesting one. I, I was talking to uh, one of the national college football writers at one of the bowl games a few years ago. I don't even remember which game it was, but you know, talking about the Tennessee beat and like the the Tennessee Fish Bowl. Uh, you know, this was this was more in the in the conversation of like the Tennessee job is like one of the low key worst jobs to have in terms of a head coach because the expectations and the demands are so great, and that's kind of a weird state where you don't necessarily. There's lots of big population centers in that state that are much closer to other SEC schools. Like Memphis is where there's, you know, you get a lot of talent out of Memphis. Memphis is a lot closer to Arkansas and Ole Miss and, you know, other schools than you are, than it is to Knoxville. So, you know, even your, your own state, you, you're not guaranteed to pull a bunch of people like Ohio State can just pull Ohio kids for the most part. So, yeah, it is, uh, that, that is a, a more challenging job than you would probably think. But yeah, I mean, you definitely have the rabid fan base there. Knoxville's also not a bad city. That's not a bad, wouldn't be a bad place to live. So yeah, that's a uh, plus, you know, easy sun sphere access. I, you know, I, I think that's not, it, it would not present the same, uh, you know, opportunities to not have uh, 50 people in the room that you do with Ohio State. But, you know, I think that would be an interesting team to cover as well. Also, Tom, my ability to, my experience of driving in the tiniest amounts of snow I could become the king. I could become their <laughs> king, like the king of Knoxville. Like I'm the only person that can drive and uh, I would be able to take over the entire city and like, look what I can do. And I, you all must bow before me because I can get from point A to point B. If you were crowned the best driver in Knoxville, do they paint your car like a light blue with STP logos on it and make you uh, pretend you're Richard Petty? It feels like that should be the prize for being the best driver in Knoxville. And paint over my zero one on my side door. I don't think so. <laughs> Your orange car will fit in great, just down, just great down there, General Lee. All right, Tony, thank you as always for being here. And if you want to hear us talk about more things involving Ohio State football, other teams from playing playing football, national college football stuff, covering college football, all sorts of other stuff, you can find that later on today on the Buckeye Weekly Podcast feed. Also, make sure you check out the episode of Michigan Monday, which dropped on uh, Monday. Makes sense. Guess what we talked about? It was Michigan. How about that? What a staggering coincidence. Uh, Michigan finally played an interesting game, so we had a lot to talk about there. And uh, the, boy, I don't want to spoil any surprises, but it might be 11-0 Ohio State against 11-0 Michigan in about a month. And uh, I think that might be a pretty good football game. So a little something to look forward to there. And a great place to uh, spend the next month as you count down the days to the Michigan game, as we do here every every day on every show, uh, would be BuckeyeHuddle.com. Fantastic team of insiders, Mark Givler and Alex Gleitman, covering recruiting. Alex just had a great uh, ep edition of his ADEC column that he dropped on Monday. Great stuff there, uh, talking about a potential five-star flip, talking about whether Ohio State might be able to pull a flip from, uh, from uh, uh, Notre Dame. Mentioned that a little earlier on the show. Really, really good stuff from Alex. 
Uh, and then, of course, Tony, Kevin, and I covering the uh, covering the team this year. A lot to talk about heading into the Iowa game. And then, of course, our team of X's and O's gurus, Ross Fulton, Justin Whitlatch, Devin Radcliffe, killing it on the X's and O's. It's all at BuckeyeHuddle.com. That'll do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.